This video is going to be my preview of the Lions-Broncos collision week 15 Saturday night in Detroit. An interesting matchup. I'm going to generally focus this only on Broncos film to be up front with you. Most people that watch my channel are either Ravens or Lions fans, so I don't feel like they need to necessarily see examples of what I'm talking about in terms of, like, for example, the number of turnovers the Lions have committed in the last four weeks offensively. It's 10. They've lost two of those four games, two and two. Fortunate, fortunate to be honest with you, to even be two and two coming out of those four games with a comeback win over the Bears and a win on the road against the Saints where they really held on to win 33-28. Going to start by talking about the Broncos' defense <clears throat> um, and who's out. First of all, Nick uh, Bonito is a talented outside linebacker, young guy. I think he's 23, 24 years old out of Oklahoma. He's leading the team with seven sacks. Uh, so he'll be out this week, and I think that's a big uh piece that's missing for the Broncos. They got star power, Justin Simmons, Patrick Sertain. Um, Alex Singleton leads them with like 136 tackles. We'll start with some overall statistics from the season and then come back to the turnovers thing because that's something that the Broncos defense has been exceptional at forcing uh, turnovers, sacks, and tackles for losses in their recent run to get their record to um, seven and six. So overall for the year, they are giving up the most amount of rushing yards in the NFL. 18, almost 1,900 yards for the season. Highest yards per carry allowed as well, 5.1, allowed 13 touchdowns on the year. Certainly looks like, at least just from that statistic, that this line, it's, a, it's an opportunity for this Lions offense to, to come out of the gate and establish what they do, what Ben Johnson does a, a great job of over the course of his career as an offensive coordinator, his short career. Recently, I don't think Ben Johnson's offense has lived up to his standard. Or, what, or the standard that we have for him and the Lions, even under uh, Jared Goff, who has a lot of turnovers lately. So leading the league in most rushing yards allowed, the Broncos. Conversely, the Lions are top 10 in the league at rushing yards allowed, only allow 3.9 yards per carry and 1,260 yards. So huge difference of, of over 600 yards allowed over the course of the season. I think that's pretty telling. You would expect... A lot of the teams that you see on film that are have a poor run defense have a, have a great pass defense, or who have a poor pass defense have a great run defense. Maybe it's scheme, maybe it's player personnel, maybe it's the defense coordinator. That's not the case here. If you look at the overall season, if, you, if you're a Broncos fan listening, this isn't meant to be disrespectful, it's just reality. The Broncos are also a bottom 10 defense in passing yards allowed, 3,300. Now, passing yards allowed isn't the complete indicator of the effectiveness of a defense. Nonetheless, the Broncos are also 10th, the lowest 10, excuse me, in touchdown passes allowed. For comparison's sake, and Lions fans will understand this acutely, the Lions have allowed 21 touchdowns passing and 3,200 yards. The Broncos have allowed 20 touchdowns and 3,300 yards. The sack numbers are also somewhat similar. Lions have had tremendous, Lions defense has had tremendous trouble uh, getting to the quarterback consistently in 2023, the injury to James Houston and then uh, Aiden Hutchinson going through a number of games where not getting sacks. I think he has one sack in the past five games, maybe six. I could be wrong there. Lions only have 28. The Broncos have 34, and they're missing Nick Benito. I'm not saying that this is a weak Broncos defense by any stretch of the imagination because in reality, in their run of winning six of seven games to get their record to seven and six, they have forced, I think, 19 turnovers. Eight, it's 18 turnovers, excuse me. They forced 18 turnovers. Now, they have allowed over 137 yards rushing three times, including 192 to the Bills in Week 10, a game in which they won 24-22, and then also allow 175 to the Vikings the following week in Week 11. They also won that game 21-20. Been winning a lot of close games, at least those two, and, 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 and to start this win streak, or this upswing, their 19-17 win over the Packers, they did allow 137 yards. Forced nine turnovers in consecutive weeks, five against the Chiefs in their upset win, 24-29 at home, and then forced four turnovers on the road to beat the Bills the following week in Week 10. And then three turnovers by the Vikings and the Browns, two last week in their 24-7 win over a faltering Chargers team. This defense, I think, is way better than the numbers, if you ask me. Now, it doesn't mean that they're a shutdown defense at this point, but they don't look like a bottom 10 defense that the stats for the overall course of the season indicate. Worst team in the league against the run. 
lowest 10, I think. Maybe it's lowest 11 in the league in terms of passing yards allowed. Only have 34 sacks. There's, I think that's middle of the pack somewhere around there. But missing Benito will be a, a huge factor. One guy to mention that I think has to be mentioned <clears throat> um, is Alex Singleton. I saw him play, I believe, for the Eagles in 2020, the the first the pandemic season, I guess I can refer to it as that. And I didn't think he looked very good. In fact, really struggled. I could be thinking of a different player. I'm going off the cuff here. But now I think he's blossoming. He's got two sacks, two fumbles recovered, 136 tackles. I believe he's had 10 tackles in damn near every game for them this year. Besides uh, Nick Bonito having seven sacks, Another uh, really young and talented edge rusher is Jonathan Cooper. He's got five and a half. He's also got two fumbles recovered. They look like to me a very active group in terms of getting to the football, forcing um, interception, getting interceptions, and or forcing fumbles and recovering the football. They seem to really thrive on turnovers. If the this looks like from that perspective, this looks like a bad matchup. Because the Lions have turned the ball over a lot, and the Broncos are really good at forcing the other team to turn it over. We'll get started with the film here. And we're actually going to talk about one element of the Broncos' defense that's really lacking, and that's their run defense. All right, we're going to take a look at about eight or ten run plays in terms of their defense against the Bills and the Vikings. They're giving up the number one, they've given up the most rushing yards in the league this season. It ends up being 144. Uh, per game, even in this seven game streak where they won six out of the seven games, they've had, if, if you ask me, an identifiable weakness in, uh, in defending out of 11 personnel defense, which is nickel, and a pulling lineman. In this case, in multiple cases here, in this, these, this cut up I've got for you, you're going to see that it's a pulling left tackle. If the offense had a fullback on the field, the defense wouldn't be in their nickel front. So you can see outside linebacker DN, D tackle. D tackle, outside linebacker D end, and two inside linebackers. So you're talking about a 4 2 in the box. People can call it a 2 4 5 if you want, but in terms of what you have in the box, if you're an offensive line coach, offensive coordinator, no one calls it a 2 4. It's a 4 2 5. They say, what's the box? It's a 4 2. So out of their nickel defense, 4 2 in the box. Whenever you get a pulling lineman like this that basically is a fullback in terms of inserting and creating a new gap, that seems to give them problems. Oftentimes it comes from the tight end side. So what they're doing is, out of a 4-2, they're controlling where the three technique is, and that's the tackle who is pulling and inserting to go get someone. And usually it's a front side or back side inside linebacker. In this case, you got Latavius Murray, who used to be a Bronco, uh, now playing for the Bills, spent a season with the Ravens for eight yards. Second possession, you can see that Josh Allen is pointing to the running back Tight end over to this side, 4-2 nickel. You can see the three technique is to the tight end side, which is you know somewhat predictable. Brings the receiver in. It's not a pulling lineman. It's just an outside zone scheme and or zone scheme, and, and Murray ends up bouncing it back for uh, 21 yards. It seems like if you can get up to the linebackers, you can get something accomplished. If you can get those guys blocked at or near the point of attack, both of them are very aggressive, and I think both of them are having really good seasons. Josie Jewell was an underrated inside linebacker. He actually had two interceptions against uh, Patrick Mahomes last year in the same game. This is uh, Nick Bonito being you know, almost kind of blocked in the back by the tight end, but he's stunting down uh, to the play side. 66 has done a great job, and Murray cuts it back off of that block against Benito, who, again, I said is going to be out. Greg Dolchitz, really talented tight end for the Broncos, is also going to be out this week. Fast forward a little bit. This is fifth possession. And you can see you got a pulling lineman again. This is James Cook for 14 yards to the right side. Again, notice the uh, indicators. Tight end controls where the three technique is. And as a result of that, they're able to back block with the guard and then wrap with the tackle. Additionally, if... Ragnow plays, you have a center who can do what the Bills center does here, which is cut off the backside inside linebacker. It's a brilliant block. He's letting the right guard handle the D tackle here by himself. So no combo. He's moving up to take 49 out. The only thing is 49 goes to the play side. So the center just rides him out of there and takes him where his momentum wants to go. And that's the cut that James Cook ends up taking advantage of. Again, getting 14 yards on the fifth possession. Wasn't enough for the Bills. 
Two plays later, went right back to it. Tight end to the top side, running back on the same side. The Broncos have kicked the three technique to the field now, so they've changed the dynamic in terms of the blocking scheme. End up leaving the edge rusher unblocked to the downside here. 51, he screams tight to the backside wall of the offensive lineman. Pulling lineman reads that and just loops around. Goes to pick someone up. In this case, Singleton, I think, ends up being unblocked. Again, it's Murray for 14 yards. Slightly different concept because of the front and the, and the way that the, they're not blocking the edge defender. Essentially, they're letting the pulling lineman read him and the running back read the pulling lineman, follow him outside for a bounce. I move forward one week against the Vikings. Now, this is actually not going to involve a pulling lineman. This is uh, Madison for 15 yards. He really tore him up on some off-tackle stuff. But you do get a significant number of plays where they're, they're pulling a lineman and inserting that player as a fullback to cr essentially create two gaps where there had been one. Broncos are in this 5-1 front, 5-1 nickel. you got an edge defender. Edge defender, only one inside linebacker. And so you have three interior D linemen, five DBs because it's 11 personnel. If this is the look they give the Lions, I would look for Ben Johnson to take advantage of this one quick, early, and often, such that uh, he probably gets the Broncos out of this look. But I could be wrong. You go to that look to be able to create pressure against the quarterback on pass plays and still have six in the box against the run. Uh, base personnel now. So three, four, look. Again, Benito will not play. He's 42 here. This is Cooper to the backside, weak side. And you've got Singleton and Jewel along with three interior linemen. So this is 21 personnel. Ben Johnson's not really using a lot of this. He's doing this out of 12 personnel. So using a tight end, either Brock Wright or Sam Laporta, as the other fullback. You can see you get a pulling lineman. It's basically power. And for whatever reason, these are this is one of the um, schemes I think they're having the most trouble with. Anything that involves a pulling lineman, some people call it a gap scheme. Could ben, ben Johnson's run offense is very multiple. Gap schemes, zone schemes, kick, trap, all kinds of uh, schemes to utilize. They're just having trouble tackling on this play. Sertain, I think, and one of the DBs who's also questionable. I think it's McMillan, I believe. Ends up on the tackle. Madison dancing around. Ends up being a 15 or 16-yard gain. Again, this is week 11, so we're not talking about very long ago. Direct snap. And the linebackers, for whatever reason, on a lot of these gap schemes just aren't there. So what I mean is, like, you've got one guy to the front side, Jewel. Singleton is also climbing over the top of the trash. When I say trash, I mean you got blocks in front of you that you want to either go front side of or go back side. And in this case, the running back's cutback ends up being into a wide open running lane. There's nobody there on the back side in terms of a defensive lineman and or an inside linebacker who kind of slow plays. And I'm not saying they're doing this things necessarily wrong, but when you get a guy wiped out like this by a front side down block, Sometimes you're going to have a big-ass gap to run through. And in this case, Madison takes it for um, eight yards. Fourth possession, same game. Just a down scheme, if you ask me. Six yards. This is You have a consistency in anything that's got a physical component against them has caused them problems. Am I saying they're, they're not a physical defense? Well, no, they forced a shit ton of turnovers here in the last seven games. But you, you got the film here for yourself. I specifically chose end zone angle film. This is F counter, so you've got a pulling guard who almost falls down over his teammate's leg. So he's the kick out block. The tight end is going to wrap up. Madison takes it for nine yards. They've just created three gaps there for only two players to defend. Downhill run concept. The Lions have got all of this. And am I saying that it's going to happen? Well, no. I don't know that. But I do know that the Lions have all of the boxes checked off to be able to do these things if Ben Johnson will commit to it, which I think he will, number one, and number two, utilize it to set things up uh, later on in the game, specifically play action for Jared Goff. But the game plan might be in reverse. Ben Johnson might come out there and want to throw the ball off play action early to get this defense off balance. I think the opportunity is there for a big day 
uh, running the football. Do I mean 192 like the Bills had or 175 uh, like the Vikings had in the two games I showed you? Not, I don't know. Uh, enough such that the Lions' offense is cleaner than we've seen recently and can avoid those situations where Jared Goff turns the football over as much as he has in their recent four-game streak. All right, let's get to some of the irregular uh, situations or maybe a little bit unpredictable that I talked about or, or alluded to earlier. Turnovers, sacks, interceptions. They've been exceptional in this seven-game run. Again, forced 18 turnovers, five by the Chiefs in this win in week eight, and then four after the bye in their win on the road against the Bills. Additionally, I think six tackles for loss in this game against the Chiefs I have on film. Uh, may, might have been seven. There was a number of situations where they, they've got guys playing downhill, playing aggressive, and and beating the Chiefs' offensive linemen um, at the point of attack, like this D-tackle does. Here to set inside counter zone handoff to Kadarius Tony. You can see the gap is there to run through. This D-tackle, one-on-one, uh, defeats the block by the left guard and is able to get a tackle for loss three yards on the Chiefs' uh, first possession, or second possession, excuse me. Later on, second in possession, third down. Everybody knows the Chiefs do a lot of this uh, trickery, shovel passes, whatever, down near the goal line, inside the five, inside the ten. It's going to be a shovel pass to Rasheed Rice, who just went in motion. It's a counter scheme. So Mahomes reading Baron Browning, the outside linebacker, D-end. You can see the pulling lineman, and then Rasheed Rice going underneath could also give the ball here on the sweep path, depending on what that edge defender does. Baron Browning is able to force... Mahomes to keep it and pitch it and then get the tackle for loss on a third down. They've been far better, I think, in the last six, seven games than they were earlier in the season at, at forcing turnovers, number one, just being more active. Interception by uh, Josh Allen over the middle, like a snag smash type concept on a third down. Not necessarily anything that they're doing to deflect the football here because this one goes off an offensive player's hands. I have seen more mug looks lately where they're dropping inside linebackers out. I felt like the Ravens really caused problems for the Lions in Week 7 on some of that mug stuff, showing five, six, seven blitzers, and then dropping one, two, or three people out. In this case, Josh Allen reads it, gets to uh, Gabe Davis over the middle, goes off his hands, <clears throat> ends up being an interception. Sometimes you're just fortunate like that. This one, I think, is a little bit different. Six possession. I think it's a great read and great job of, of elevating to catch the ball by the corner to the top side of the screen. You got a deep out up at the top side here. The corner is just sitting on it, but he's leaving enough space to allow Josh Allen to throw it. I think this is somewhat intentional. I don't think he's – I think there's an op, there's, it's a possibility here that he knew the route – I think they're a very smart defense in terms of their secondary and reading things. They've had three different defensive coordinators, I think, in the past five years. Given up a lot of yards, don't get me wrong. Recently, things to me, things look better. The film that I have, which I went all the way back to uh, the Chiefs game, they look very competitive, if you ask me, and, and a lot more multiple. Here's an example of uh, what I would call a Tampa 2 variation. It's a DN dropping out Singleton. Uh, running the pipe between the, the two hashes, flat corner, flat corner. So they're very multiple in coverage, and I think that's one of the reasons why they've been able to get some interceptions late, lately. This one is a pretty unbelievable pick, if you ask me, by the nickel defender to the top side. I'm not sure what Mahomes thought in terms of being able to stick that one in there. One interesting element is three of the Lions' last four games have been against division opponents, the Packers and the Bears twice. And in that time period, to me, is, is when it seems like the Lions' offense has struggled the most in terms of generating open receivers. Passing lanes seem to be clogged. Uh, this one's a DPI on Sertain to the top of the field. He does have one additional interception this year, but this one got called back for a defensive penalty, like I said. The Lions' pass game, I don't, I'm not going to say it's been figured out. I don't know that. I can't say that. But there is some indication that the Bears and Packers had some really good game plans to disrupt what Ben Johnson, Jared Goff, and the, and the receivers and tight ends for the Lions like to do. I will say this. There is enough evidence for me against the Broncos 
to feel comfortable stating this. The opportunity is there not just for a big day with the run game with running backs, but also to throw the ball to tight ends and running backs. I feel like sometimes they've um, had trouble covering those guys. Again, 34 sacks this season, I think, is about middle of the pack for their defense. This is one by Jones, the D-tackle, where they, they were able to contain Mahomes. Against some of the more athletic quarterbacks, there's been times where guys have been able to escape, guys have been able to cause problems, specifically Josh Dobbs. Three completions um, in this Week 11 game where he was able to get away from defensive linemen and cause problems and or complete a pass downfield. But the Lions don't have the benefit of that type of quarterback, clearly. Josh Goff, uh, Jared Goff is kind of on the other end of the spectrum from uh, Josh Dobbs in that he has had significant trouble against pressure, particularly lately, but even more so uh, kind of throughout his career. I think there's a defense that's surging that can cause problems for the Lions in terms of turnovers, sacks, and interceptions. So clearly there's the need for Jared Goff to uh, course correct and protect the football more. Uh, also, hopefully, the offensive line. It sounds like Ragnow and Decker are both going to play and both be available. If you get 90 95% of their capability against this team, I think that really levels up the Lions' offense in terms of what they can do yards-wise and points-wise and also minimizes the possibility of some of these turnovers that the Broncos have feasted on in recent weeks. The last part of this preview here, again, this is somewhat abbreviated. I wanted, to, I wanted to have this out Friday night, but these are becoming increasingly difficult to produce just by the sheer amount of content to try to get out on the Ravens and the Lions, number one, and number two, my availability. So it's a little bit of a departure from my intention or what I wanted to focus on in this preview. I want to talk about Cortland Sutton. Now, I will mention some other guys here before we get to the film of Sutton. Number one, he's, he's got 10 touchdowns this season. I think that's remarkable. They... The Broncos have thrown 23 touchdowns this year. Ten of them have been to Sutton. Doesn't mean there aren't other weapons. Uh, Jerry Judy has 42 catches, only one touchdown. A couple other guys have three touchdowns each. Um, Samaj Pirine, or Perrine, I think it's Pirine, used to play for the Bengals. Underrated football player, really. I thought he was a force of nature. If you recall, he had a huge touchdown on screen against the Chiefs in the AFC title game, the, the Bengals upset in 2021. He has 40 catches this year, second on the team, or third on the team, excuse me, behind Sutton and Judy. But Pirine's 40 catches have come on 44 targets. He only has 378 yards receiving. He doesn't have a touchdown. But he's got 18 first down catches on 44 targets. I feel like that's a remarkable number. His catch percentage is 90%. Um, another running back has 22 catches on 25 targets. Uh, Jaleel McLaughlin, hopefully I said his last name right. So you're talking about between the two of them, P. Ryan and McLaughlin. I probably mispronounced one or both of their names. 62 catches on 69 targets. That is, to me, Javante Williams, the other running back who's a, a load to try to tackle. He leads the team with 650 yards rushing. He's got 32 catches on 41 targets for a 78% catch percentage. You're, you're talking about running backs have a really high catch percentage in this offense. I think that's an underrated element of the offense. Nonetheless, even though I do have significant film of that, I'm going to focus on Cortland Sutton. A 28-year-old big X receiver has 10 touchdown catches this year. Uh, catch percentage is nowhere near those guys that I, that I just mentioned. His catch percentage, uh, 67%, 53 catches on 79 targets. 10 touchdowns, 32 first down catches. He's a real problem uh, to the boundary, if you ask me, and a guy that they focus on exclusively sometimes in the red zone. And you can't blame Russell Wilson um, and those guys for, for trying to get him the football in the red zone because he's been so effective. We'll go over his impact against the uh, Raiders. Forgive me for that. I didn't have the full screen enabled. And his impact against uh, the Packers. Here he is, the downside of the screen. These two first routes I show you is going to illustrate some of the conflict. So you got a, a deeper out that Ja'Korian Bennett, who's a Maryland guy, so I'm supporting him. Um, would love to do a film study video on him in, sometime during the season, but just finding the time. So Ja'Korian Bennett is putting his foot in the ground and breaking and trying to get to the football. You can see Russell Wilson hasn't let go of the football yet, trying to get it out here to Cortland Sutton on this deep out, and he does for nine yards to Corey and Bennett just a little bit late. Like, why? Why is he so? Why is he late, quote-unquote? He's not late. He's playing it extremely well. He's also got to worry about routes like this. So this is third possession. 
bottom side of the screen, Jacorian Bennett, Cortland Sutton down there again. Watch this little hedge. Now, it's a little bit of a different release for Sutton, but I think that's actually – it's a defensive pass interference on, on Bennett, by the way. Keep in mind the route that he just won on for nine yards. There's a little bit of an inside release, but that also might be to try to sell Bennett that he's going to break this thing to the outside such that when Cortland Sutton leans to the inside just enough, Bennett's posture is broken down a little bit. He's got to grab here once with his right hand on the hip and then interfere again, but thankfully the refs had already called the attempted hold. Ends up being a DPI. Just use those two routes to illustrate the conflict he can put you in. Now, how does that relate to the Lions? It's a bad matchup, him going against Jerry Jacobs. It just is. I feel like it reminds me of DK Metcalf going against Jerry Jacobs. Now, people would not put Cortland Sutton in the same class as DK Metcalf in terms of athleticism, etc. Now, this is that same possession, by the way. Him and Russell Wilson have a nice ability to adapt in the middle of the play. You can see the safety has fronted up Sutton coming from the other side of the field. Wilson hasn't found anything yet that he likes. As he moves to the outside, Sutton sells moving to the middle of the field to the safety. And then watch Russell Wilson point. Him and Sutton on the same page. Sutton had already made the break. He didn't need Wilson to point. This is just confirmation that they're reading things the same way. Strike from Wilson, who's playing a whole lot better this year, obviously, than he did last year. Five-yard touchdown on third possession. Against the Bears, top side, a little skinny post. People have different names for this. You got third down, another moment, another element to Sutton's impact, if you ask me, that needs to be mentioned. He's got a lot of catches on third down. Like I said, 32 catches for first downs. I'd like to know how many of those are actually on third downs. Just a third and nine against the Bears. And look at Wilson's trust in Sutton. You've got a second level dropper here, Tremaine Edmonds, inside linebacker there. Looks like a red zone version of Tampa 2 to me. And then he strikes this in there between the linebackers, right in Sutton's hands. Uh, he trusts the guy and, as well he should. He's playing incredibly well. I would say from a Lions perspective, talking about the Lions defense, He's a guy to worry about in the red zone on third down specifically. I will be interested. The conflict is there, meaning you've got a guy who some people would say, well, we got to double him. we got other talented receivers on the Broncos team, number one. Number two, already established for you that the running backs catch the ball at an incredibly high rate. And then number three, Russell Wilson retains enough of his athleticism to be a thorn in the, the pass rush's side for the Lions that's really struggled against athletic quarterbacks, primarily Justin Fields, and Lamar Jackson. At this point in 2023, Russell Wilson doesn't fit into their class speed, athleticism, explosiveness, etc. But he can extend the play. He's always been able to do that. Uh, one of the coaches for, on the sideline for the Broncos knows this is a touchdown. you got an obvious pick route here to clear Sutton for the uh, slot fade out of a bunch alignment. Wherever he's – oh, by the way, this is a third down again. This is a third and four, and it's in the red zone. So it fits all of the parameters I'm describing to you in terms of where Sutton has the most impact. Not that he can't make catches you know, in between the 20s. Not that he can't have an impact on first down, play action perhaps. But this is a guy on third down, particularly inside the red zone. Man, if you're a Lions fan, you hope that Aaron Glenn and those guys have some type of plan to defend him. Third and five, again, against the Packers. He's up at the top side of the screen. Wide alignment, kind of, once you see the route, it'll make sense to you why there's such a wide alignment. Big body on these slants. It's been the same dynamic for big receivers uh, for decades. If you can get to the inside, if you can win to the inside, Russell Wilson puts it right there. Quick release where it's supposed to be. 11-yard gain for Sutton to get the first down. Last one. Down here to the bottom side. Again, third down, third and seven against the Packers. Going to win on this kind of outside release go against man coverage. Wilson trusts him, believes in him as well he should, man. Cortland Sutton's having an amazing year, if you ask me. It's fun to watch, look at from a Ravens fan's perspective. We were looking for a receiver in the last two years. He was a guy that had been mentioned, and, and that's part of the reason why I was so happy to see him doing well, number one. And number two, why when it came time to produce this preview, albeit late, like I said, and I saw that Cortland Sutton was still having a great year, I knew that I was going to do this part of this piece. I know I wasn't able to cover uh, too many elements of this preview, really only three as it stands here recently, late in the season. I really feel like I can't get to 
more than three elements of a, of a game to preview it, number one, because there's two teams I'm trying to create previews of, so forgive me for that. If you think that there's a more efficient way for me to do previews, feel free to let me know. I understand that there's other content out there that maybe doesn't show film, number one, or number two, maybe focuses on only one element. I've considered changing the previews uh, to do that as well. This one, again, is one I wanted to have out on Friday evening for you guys to enjoy, and let me know what you think. Let me know what your predictions are for the game. I think this is a, I don't want to say make or break game. There's probably a, a, a far better phrase to use than that one. But this is a moment for the Lions to to make a statement, if you ask me. And right now, <clears throat> being 9-4 and four, with two of those losses coming in the last four games, I feel like this is a moment for the Lions team to elevate themselves. 10-4 and four would feel a whole lot different than 9-5. and five. To me, at least. You let me know if you share the same thoughts. I would have a lot more confidence going into the final three games of the season, Vikings, Cowboys, and Vikings, with the Cowboys game being on the road against a team that has playing really well for most of the season and has a defense, specifically one corner, who's forcing a crap ton of interceptions and taking a lot of them back to the house. This Broncos team doesn't have that much, that that element, at least not to that exponential power in terms of the pick sixes that the Cowboys have been able to generate, even with Trayvon Diggs being out. But nonetheless, 18 turnovers forced in the last seven games. A real cause for concern uh, for this Lions offense that's that's been turning the football over a lot, specifically Jared Goff, 10 times in the last four games. If they can get away from that and, and not turn the football over at all, if you just look at the game results this season, when they haven't turned the football over, 42 points in a win against the Panthers. 20 points in a win against the Bucs on the road. I thought that day the Bucs defense played spectacular, and the Lions were still able to generate 380 yards of offense, Goff generating 340 passing yards. Fast forward four weeks, no turnovers in a road win over the Chargers, 41 points scored. The best offensive game in this past four-week stretch, not the Chargers game, was the win on the road against the Saints, no turnovers, 33 points scored. If they can come in here and not turn the football over against this Broncos team, for me, it's difficult to see the Broncos winning unless the Broncos offense just becomes unstoppable and you get a game similar to that Chargers game, 41-38 win for the Lions, or similar to that Saints game on the road, 33-28 win for the Lions. This is a huge opportunity. This Lions team is better, to me, in my opinion, than what they've played the last four weeks. I haven't seen complimentary football, if you ask me, in a long time meaning all three phases working together. Haven't seen an offense that's smooth. And, and, I ha- and last week against Justin Fields, there was an attempt on defense to be more multiple. Um, it didn't work in certain cases because I don't think the offense complied, had 13 points at the half, and had the ball in the third quarter, unable to do anything in the third quarter or second half at all offensively. It's a moment where Ben Johnson has probably got to prove himself if he wants to he wants to keep the Lions in that conversation as a team that could maybe get one or two playoff wins in the NFC. Appreciate you guys' time, man. Let me know what you think of the preview, what you think of some of my thoughts here, and, and the elements that I chose to cover for this game. The, the run defense for the Broncos being a, a relative weakness. Their ability to turn the football over, get to the quarterback at times, specifically lately, get tackles for loss, interceptions. And then finally, Cortland Sutton being a guy who is fun to watch uh, except he probably won't be on Saturday night because I think he could cause problems for this Lions secondary. Appreciate you guys' time. If you think other Lions fans would enjoy this this film study slash commentary look or preview at the Lions-Broncos game on Saturday night, then please consider grabbing a link to this video, sharing it out on social media to help this content get more reach.